Well, welcome to all you Bible scholars out there. We are uh, finishing up today our look through the book of Job uh, in our study of the wisdom uh, books, parts of the Bible. Um, we've taken a few sessions to glance through Job, and um, we're going to wrap that up uh, with this little section today. Uh, back at the beginning of this, I, I sent out, if you're on our email list, uh, uh, an outline of Job, the structure of Job, and um, we have covered everything on that now except the little section we're in today, which runs from chapter 38 through the beginning of chapter 42. Remember how we did this. We we looked at the very beginning and the very end of Job uh, to start, which are the two prose sections, and then we began working through all the poetry, uh, the wisdom debates in the middle. And so what we've seen so far is the basic story of Job, what happened to him uh, at the beginning and at the end, how everything was taken away from him at the beginning and restored to him at the end. And then we have uh, looked at his exchange with his friends, these cycles of debates, speeches between he and his three friends. And then at the end of that, remember, Another person shows up, Elihu, which is what we uh, in part looked at last week. Elihu comes in at the end, this angry young man who wants to set everybody straight. And uh, his explanation of what was happening to Job was uh, basically what the other friends had said with a little bit of a twist. Uh, remember... The three friends had said, Job, you've obviously sinned. Why don't you just confess your sin and everything will be okay? And the reason you're suffering is because of your sin. And Elihu, in essence, agrees with that, but he adds the twist that, um, that the purpose of the suffering isn't just punishment, but it is indeed to teach Job something. It's educative. And so Job should not question God. He should not accuse God. God is just. He's just trying to teach you something. And, and so uh, this ends the, the uh, cycles of speeches between Job and his friends. And then uh, with chapter 38, we finally get to what God has to say about all of this. And... Um, and his response to it in chapters 38 through 42. Uh, remember there's a little section at the end, beginning at verse 7 of chapter 42, verses 7 through 17 of, of 42, that we've already looked at where everything is restored back to Job and so forth. Uh, but we're going to uh, look at this section of God's response. It's really one of my favorite sections of scripture um, you know when I was a kid uh, I went to church a lot uh, we were a family that was at church every time the door was open so Sunday morning Bible class Sunday morning worship Sunday evening worship Wednesday night Bible class VBS uh, revival meetings whatever okay so you sort of get the picture of my growing up and, and I'm not complaining about that at all uh, but as a little kid, uh, sitting in worship, uh, it's sometimes a struggle to follow everything that's going on, especially the sermon. Uh, and I remember one thing that I did uh, to, to pass the time. Of course, this was in the days before smartphones and all the other methods of entertainment we might have, uh, you know, today to um, pass the time. Uh, what I did was grab one of the pew Bibles, and a lot of times I would read in the book of Revelation. So you can imagine uh, this young kid who, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't, uh, hasn't been reading for that long. I mean, I did this very young. 
uh, maybe up into my teen years as well, but I would read it in Revelation. I thought it was fascinating. I didn't understand a lot of it. But anything that talked about uh, red dragons and white horses and uh, all those plagues and everything else, it was fascinating to me. And so I would read it and read it and read it. Well, uh, I thought as I was reviewing this section of Job, if I had known about this section of Job, I would have read this as well. It's just fascinating. And, and I hope you'll, you'll see that as we look through it. But it's really interesting, neat stuff. So God speaks at the beginning of this section in chapter 38. And let's just notice the first four verses to just sort of get a feel for, for how it begins. It says, uh, verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, uh, We don't know what the whirlwind was. Some impressive thing, no doubt. Uh, but he speaks to Job out of, out of a tornado, oh, some impressive um, natural thing. God speaks out of it, and he says this. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. So that's just the beginning of it. And you notice some questions there that God has for Job. And we don't know, you know, are the friends someplace within earshot of this as well? We don't know, but he's addressing these questions, it seems, to Job. And he begins by characterizing everything that has gone before so all the speeches as dark counsel and words without knowledge. He immediately passes judgment on everything that has gone before. And, uh, you know, when he says words without knowledge, if you think back to some of our introductory stuff on the wisdom literature, what has been in parallel with knowledge before? Uh, remember we talked about how in, in this Old Testament poetry you have this parallelism. If you wonder what the meaning of a word is, look what's in the next line. Sometimes it'll clue you in by a word that's in parallel with it. What has been placed in parallel with knowledge before? Wisdom. So um, when God says everything that's come before are words without knowledge, he is saying that what has gone before is not wisdom. So what the friends have said, the three friends and Elihu, and I assume in part what Job has said, although Job doesn't get judged quite as strictly, uh, but everything that's gone before have been things that are not wisdom. God immediately passes judgment. Always keep that in mind as you're reading and interpreting the book of Job. Uh, that God is, is, uh, is pretty clear in his condemnation of what the friends say. And then, um, if you think about in, uh, in, in the wisdom books, you know, wisdom always begins with the fear of the Lord. Uh, we'll see this in Proverbs, which is probably where we'll go next in our study. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, um, and, th and this is not necessarily a, a quaking in your boots type of fear, although it could include that. Uh, it's more of a respect, an awe, um, an attitude, almost of a, like a, a desire to learn from God. That's... That's the fear, a, a humble acknowledgement that he is God and we are not. That's the fear of the Lord. And, and so really what this section is designed to do, uh, God's speech to Job is to reinforce the fear of the Lord in Job 
and all the readers of Job, which of course includes us. So as we begin to look through this and, and we ask, what's this about? Why, you know, why is this here? It's really supposed to impress the fear of the Lord, not the um, um, I'm scared of him kind of fear, but the respect, the awe, the, uh, the wanting to learn from, um, the understanding that he's God, we're not, that is supposed to be impressed upon Job here and, and upon us. So, uh, we'll look down through this. One other thing in that first section that we read in verse 3, uh, interesting picture phrase there where in the English Standard Version that I'm reading from it says dress for action like a man God says to Job if you read the older versions the American Standard or the King James Version it'll say something like gird up your loins like a man uh, that'll also be said a little bit later in God's speech what's that about gird up your loins or dress for action a dress for action is a really good translation of that phrase. Uh, literally, it is gird up your loins. Uh, it, you have to sort of keep in mind the way that men dressed in the ancient world. A lot of times they almost had a, sort of a tight-fitting garment, a skirt-like garment uh, that they wore. And if you've ever tried to run, or move quickly in something like that, you probably have fallen on your face. And girding up your loins is just, oh, in the country they might say, hitch up your britches, uh, sort of pull up uh, that garment so you can move your legs fast. That's the idea. It's a, it's a word picture. It's saying get ready for action, dress for action. Uh, we don't think of anything like that today, you know, uh, sprinters and things like that in, in our day and age wear very tight fitting clothing that doesn't doesn't obstruct their uh, movement uh, but in an ancient culture where they dress like that they had to prepare for action and uh, and that's uh, that's what that phrase is all about uh, that's a phrase also used in the New Testament in a place or two um, that you may run into it as well, uh, but looking down through this this chapter, God begins to ask Job a a series of questions. Um, in fact, He's going to ask more than seventy questions. So, if you think about the things that Job has said to God in the book, it's been a lot of questions He's asked. Um, and now God has some questions. He doesn't respond with answers to Job's questions. He responds with more questions. Uh, this is very similar to um, the way Jesus responded to people many times. They would ask him something, and he would ask a question in return. God does this uh, to the nth degree here. Just a series of questions for Job. He begins in verse 4. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. You hear the sarcasm in, in God's words. Uh, verse 8, Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out? from the womb when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band again this is poetry uh, this isn't scientific language this is poetry it's asking Job you know uh, where were you when I created everything and set everything up uh, verse 12 have you commanded the morning since your days began or caused the dawn to know its place Verse 16, have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Uh, verse 19, 
Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness? Verse 22, a favorite of, of many people in the winter months, God asked Job, have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail? Again, we're not to understand this literally that there are storehouses where God uh, has stacks of snow that he throws upon the earth in the winter. Uh, sort of like we have storehouses for salt that we use to melt it. No, this is poetry. God is saying, Job, you know, do you know where snow comes from? And where hail comes from? Um, are you able to generate it, Job? That kind of thing. And it just continues on this way throughout this opening of God's words. Um, and and uh, it's just one, God is just peppering Job with these unanswerable questions. Um, I guess the only answer Job could give it to all of them is no. no I, I haven't been to the storehouses of snow and that kind of thing, but they're, they're really meant to be rhetorical. That is not to be answered. The questions are to uh, impress upon Job the greatness of God, which is something that he, he needed to be reminded of. And then in... In chapter 39, God takes Job to the zoo, we might say. And he begins talking to him about uh, the, the animal kingdom and that kind of thing. And so, for instance, verse 1 of chapter 39, the questions continue. Do you know, Job... Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Well, what could Job say other than no? Haven't been up in the mountains and observed this. Uh, and, and think of how long in human history the answer would have been no. And not until National Geographic came along and, and were able to climb mountains with high-def cameras have we been able to see mountain goats give birth. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? God asks. Verse 5. Who has let the wild donkey go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift donkey? Verse 9. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will he spend the night at your manger? Have you tamed wild animals, Job? Are you able to do that? God implies, I, I can. Of course, he's the creator of them. But you see the kind of questions God is asking. Verse 13, the wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are they the pinions and plumage of love? Talks about the ostrich, may, maybe something that Job had never even seen. Who knows? Uh, verse 19, do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you control the ho horse or adorn the horse, Job? Verse 26, Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars and spreads his wing toward the south? Verse 27, Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? You see the point. I mean, we just selected a few of these more than 70 questions that God asks of Job. And over and over, uh, the point is made. Um, look at the awesomeness of God. And can you comprehend it? Do you have this kind of power, Job? That kind of thing. And that's pretty much the essence of chapters 38 and 39 of what God says. And then there is a pause at the beginning of chapter 40. Uh, the Lord says to Job in chapter 40, verse 1, uh, and, and verse 2, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? 
He who argues with God, let him answer it. And so, after all these questions, have you seen this? Have you done this? God says, uh, you seem to want to take me to court. Job, do you have answers for any of these questions that, that I've asked you? And Job has a very brief response, beginning in verse 3, where we begin to see uh, the intended effect of God's speech uh, being realized. That is, remember we said the intent is to impress upon Job the fear of the Lord. Well, it's working. Because look at what Job says. Verse 3, Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer. Twice, but I will proceed no further. Job is getting the point. Uh, but there's more to come. God continues uh, with, with his speech in verse 6. If you look at verse 6 of chapter 40, it's similar to the way this begun, began. Uh, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Dress for action like a man. Remember, that's the gird up your loins. I will question you and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like his? We get the, the, uh, the impression here that God is being very loud in, in the way he speaks to Job. And can you speak this loudly, Job, that kind of thing? Uh, no doubt this is making a great impression on Job. And, and, and it continues here. Um, so we said in, in the previous chapter, God sort of takes Job to the zoo and talks to him about some of the animals he created, um, perhaps many of which Job had never seen before. Now, um, God leaves the zoo and shows him shows Job a couple of animals that no zoo can hold. Uh, and, and these are called behemoth and leviathan. Behemoth and leviathan in chapter 40 and 41. Now those words, behemoth and leviathan, are basically uh, Hebrew words. That's the original language of the Old Testament, Hebrew that the translators, they looked at these words and they basically said, we don't know how to translate this. And so they just took the, the, the letters from Hebrew and put them over into English. All right, so they're transliterated. That's the term for that. So behemoth and Leviathan are from, from Hebrew. Uh, we have no English equivalent. And that's because we really don't know what these, these uh, creatures were. Um, they are animals no zoo can hold. And he introduces Job to them. Uh, beginning chapter 40, verse 15, God says, Behold behemoth, which I made as I made you. Job, you're my creation. I also made behemoth. He eats grass like an ox. Behold, his strength is in his loins, his power in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs like bars of iron. He is the first of the works of God. Does that mean the first thing God created? No, more likely it's the most impressive thing that God made. Uh, let him who made him bring near his sword. For the mountains yield food for him where all the wild beasts play. Under the lotus plants he lies in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh. For his shade the lotus trees cover him. The willows of the brook surround him. 
Behold, if the river is turbulent, he is not frightened. He is confident, though Jordan rushes against his mouth. So if he's in a, a raging river, it does not sway him. This is a massive creature, uh, strong, impressive. Um, and he ends, verse 24, can one take him by his eyes or pierce his nose with a snare? Now that's a silly question. Obviously not. He's too big. He can't be caught. He cannot be tamed. No zoo could hold him. I made him, Job, just like I made you. Uh, behold, behemoth. And, and so, again, uh, translators don't know what this thing is. You'll sometimes see a footnote where they make a suggestion. Uh, let's face it, we don't know what it was. A large land animal of some kind. Um, I have my opinion of what it was. Uh, I'll let you form yours. It's just as good in my opinion. But large, impressive. God says, the greatest thing I ever made. The first of the works of the Lord. And if you're impressed with that, uh, even more so will you be with Leviathan in chapter 41. Uh, chapter 41 begins more questions for Job. Can you, Job, draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? All these questions, if they're going to get an answer, the answer is going to be no, I can't. Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Uh, no, no. You see, this is the way... Uh, this is answered, and you read on down through, it's, it's a fantastic creature as well. Large, armored in some way. You can't pierce him with, with a sword or a spear. And in addition to be, being armored, he breathes fire. So, again, we can see why... We don't know how to translate this. We just steal the word from Hebrew and call it Leviathan because we've got a large, armored, fire-breathing, aquatic animal. Uh, the, one of the major differences is between behemoth and Leviathan. Behemoth is a land animal. Leviathan uh, uh, seems to live at least part of the time in the water. And he breathes fire. I mean, he sounds like a dragon. Uh, but we don't know what it was. And it's not re really the point what it was. The point is God made it. And really the point is revealed in verse 10 of chapter 41. Here's the Lord's point in bringing up Leviathan. He says this, No one is so fierce that he dares to stir him up. That is, um, there's no great champion, uh, warrior, whatever, who is so awesome in his strength and ability that he would dare to mess with Leviathan, wake him up, uh, perturb him in any way. And so the conclusion of that verse is, who then is he who can stand before me? You're all afraid of Leviathan, and I made him. Why aren't you afraid of me? Why don't you fear me, Job? Or human being reading Job? You see, you see the point that's being that's being made and driven at. If you can't deal with Leviathan, how can you expect to handle me? And so we have uh, behemoth and we have Leviathan that God shows Job. And that's really uh, the rest of chapter 41 is further description of this awesome creature that God made. So, and that, that gets us um, basically to the end of the book. Uh, except a little section that we'll look at the beginning of chapter 42. 
And just reflecting on this a bit, you know, I remember Job, one of the things Job wanted was his day in court with God. Uh, does Job get his day in court? Does God answer the question that Job had or the question that a lot of us ask when we read Job? That is, why does Job suffer? Why has all this happened to Job? Does God answer that question? No. In fact, he asks Job more than 70 questions rather than answering a single one of Job's questions. Job does not get a bunch of new information about the thing that was concerning him. But he does get a new relationship with God, which is actually what he needed. He doesn't get the answer to his question, but he does get a new relationship. God moves him sort of from words to experience. Uh, look how this works out as Job makes his brief answer to all God has said at the beginning of chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things. Well, that makes sense. Job has gotten the point of all God has shown him. I know that you can do all things, Job says to God, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And then he quotes something that God had said. He says, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. He's quoting God. You see how much he's learned? Then Job says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. He, he knew words about God. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. God moves Job from words to experience. How do we understand what's going on? You know, the friends and uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Elihu thought God was sort of this remote, aloof being, um, separate, uh, one to, to fear, indeed fear in a shaking, quaking kind of fear. And that's... The, the image that sort of shaped their worldview. Uh, Job, you've sinned. God is punishing you, and you deserve it. That's, that's the God that they understood. Job discovers a God who actually wants a personal relationship. He, he discovers a God who will answer but he's going to answer on his own terms. He's not necessarily going to answer your exact question that you have, but he's going to give you the answer you need. And so the question of why do I suffer? Why has this happened to me? Is really the wrong question. The right question is who is God? And that's the one that God answers. That's the, the, the question that Job gets an answer to. Who is God? And that's really what he needed. Um, God is a God to, to be feared. Again, not in the sense of I'm afraid of him, although that's okay. It's I understand how great and awesome and beyond me he is, although he wants to be close to me. He, I, I am not him. I can't do what he does. God is, according to his own words, directly involved in the world he made. He's not separate. 
and aloof. I mean, he's involved. He asked Job, have you seen the, the mountain goats give birth? You know, he made the mountain goats. He knows what goes on with them. He's involved. He's not separate. And he can be trusted. He is working on the world from the inside, not from the outside. He's involved. And so that sort of reminds us of some of the, the summary thoughts we, we uh, brought up earlier when we were just sort of introducing the wisdom books. Um, some of these are reinforced in the book of Job. Remember we said that, that God is the source and giver of wisdom. Uh, we said that the role of wisdom is to give order and structure to life in this world uh, as God did as he created the world. He brought, dis he brought order from disorder and that is wisdom's role in our life to bring order and structure. And so that Job is helped in that by getting a better idea of who God is. Also the idea that God is involved in his world, in the world that he made. He's working on it, working in it from within, not from without. And then also God is a relational God. God speaks to Job. Uh, did he have to? No, but he did. And that tells us that God wanted a relationship with Job, uh, just like he wants with us. Fascinating book. I love this last section, God's words. And I guess uh, one thing it does is it forces us uh, to, to have faith. I mean, who of us would criticize Job for having these questions of why these awful things had happened in his life? Why did I lose my children and my health and, and all these things that, that he had questions about? And God doesn't answer. But God gives Job what he, rather than what he wants, he gives Job what he needs, a better understanding of him. Is that sufficient for us? Well, Faith will determine our answer to that. Uh, next time we will, I think, start into um, just an overview of the, the book of Proverbs, which is usually the book people think of when, when we think of wisdom books. It's sort of the classical wisdom book of the Bible. So we'll take a little bit of time and glance through Proverbs in our continuing quest for wisdom. Thank you again for... Um, watching and being a part of this study. I hope it's a blessing to you. Hope you have a great day and uh, God bless you in your quest as well. Take care.